<laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, it is a pleasure to meet you all digitally. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about, so a little bit about me, um, because I, I don't know, you guys invited me to come and stuff. Um, I currently work as a content strategist for Publicis Sapient, which is a giant um, agency uh, slowly evolving into a consultancy that specializes in digital business transformation. Um, and it's one company in the giant holding company that is Publicis Group. Um, I've been there for a little over six years um, as a content strategist the whole time. It was the first time I had held the content strategy role. Um, and uh, before that, I, I have this very interesting checkered past that you can look up on LinkedIn where I have a master's in library science. So I've worked as a librarian. I'm a, a researcher at heart. Um, I can also say I'm a professional taxonomist. It's very exciting. I'm that nerd. Um, I, I uh, have worked in front end web development, worked in quality assurance and usability. I've worked as a technical writer, as a product owner, um, in editorial. I worked writing box and manual copy. Um, I was an English major, so I have that uh, combination of technical and communication uh, that works really well for content strategy. And I'll talk about it in a minute. The content strategy realm is, is evolving and we're even confused about ourselves. Um, but um, I had never really heard of Industry 4.0 before, if I'm honest. And if I had heard of it, I promptly forgot it. Uh, so when Chaka was like, yeah, Industry 4.0 and content strategy is like, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to go find out. So um, I basically have approached this as the sort of beginner's mind journey. Um, where, you know, it's very suited to the time where I want to take everything and scale it back. And and make it have a lot of white space and think about it without necessarily trying to make it do too much. And so this presentation, I'm not, I'm not an industry 4.0 um, expert. I'm not going to try to be, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you my story. That's basically what's going on here. Um, I'm American and I'm from New York. So if you're having a hard time placing the accent, that's where it's from. Uh, so knowing that I am with my people right now, um, we are all content uh, professionals in some form or fashion. Um, and content is a routinely misunderstood labor of love. We've covered it. The other presentations you know, spoke about it very eloquently. Um, people think that they can do our jobs if they, even if they wanted to, they couldn't. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about you know, what different kinds of content are um, categorizing them, organizing them, writing them, making them useful to people. Um, and what's really interesting about that is that content is what comprises communication. Communication is made of content. Regardless of what type of content you're creating, content is there to convey a message with purpose. Um, and it can be diagrams, it can be documentation, it can be release notes, it can be commands, it can be anything. Um, and I think that a lot of places, they think of documentation as this thing you tack on at the end, if you're lucky, if you have the time. Um, and it's a sort of, we wrote it, so, you know, it's done. People will look at it and it's like, mm, that's not, that's not how human behavior works. Like. You need to make content that's actually consumable. And it's not, you know, writing it down isn't the same as we've communicated something. Um, I was just listening to a Content Matters podcast that Chaco sent me where Alan Porter said that content is the largest unused asset in most businesses. It's something that can basically cover all of the basis for what a business, a process, um, any type of organization does always starts with content as communication in some form or fashion. It's not the only use for content, but it is a major use for content. Now, when we think about content strategy, I kind of think about content strategy as even more mysterious to most people. Like they think that uh, documentation and content and all of these things that we record so that we can hand them off to each other so that we can understand things is, oh yeah, we do that and it's easy, but it's not, and I don't understand why it's so hard and whatever. 
trying to explain content strategy to people is like its own struggle. I feel like we're the vestal virgins of <laughs> content organization. We have this mystery about us, but nobody knows what to do with us. Um, and I think within the content strategy world, oh yeah. So <laughs> to the point of, I didn't set my timer. I'm gonna start that now. <laughs> um, in the content strategy world, this diagram that I'm showing you right now is created by brain traffic. It's called the content strategy quad. I believe the last time it was updated was in 2018. Um, and I find brain traffic to be a really good resource for content strategists, especially if they're still getting their footing and trying to figure out their lives. Um, but a brain traffic defines content strategy as guiding the creation, delivery, and governance of useful, usable content. So, you know, if you think of content strategy as this like hub that specializes in communication, it would make sense that, you know, I think that before we were talking about um, like role evolutions and how there needs to be a little bit more differentiation because of, you know, how everything's too big or um, too many parts and things like that. Um, content strategists, when I started, did all of these things. Um, they did the editorial and the experience and the structure and the process as well as like the the process in terms of the how it work they a cms or you know the sort of mechanical processes that need to happen when you're publishing on top of all of the people stuff so that was all one person and in my role i still do this i still do all of these elements myself my company has not decided to differentiate these things I think out in the world, what you're starting to see more of is this evolution, but it's not evenly distributed. Hat tip to William Gibson, thank you. But um, content designers are a separate role. I just finished a course through um, Future Learn about content design because whenever I see something that's talking about a title or something in my, in my domain, I'm like, I need to go and study because I'm never done learning. And even if I do this for a living, I need to know how other people talk about it so that I can have valuable conversations with clients and people. So um, content designers are actually off as, like I said, more, um, abundantly. And they're more sort of focused on the front endy feel of uh, the content strategy domain. So editorial um, research, a little bit more about like analytics, a little bit more about the sort of user experience of the content. Um, I like to think of it as front endy. I that's not the whole and soul, and it's not just about like front endy web design or web development. It's also, you know, in a process workflow, it could be, you know, process participant facing versus the people who build the system that they're using. So front endy kind of stuff. So it's more about how the content communicates. That's their focus. And then when you get into more of the systems design part of things where it's like, okay, you're dealing in content structures and process and what um, CMS is or um, other sort of um, process systems do in their steps to make something go, to create widgets, whatever it is. Um, it's, more of a, it's more about how the content builds. So uh, there's an emerging um, title that seems to keep coming and going called Content Engineer. Um, and I've seen it in some places, not in others. It's a little, it's not evenly distributed. Um, and so that's more of a sort of back end um, interfacing with developers, uh, heavier on like the business analyst relationship. It's not the only place that they live, but it's where they're focused. Um, and then content strategists, instead of doing everything, although the expectation on a certain level is that when you get to the content strategist role, you understand all of these things and maybe hopefully have done them, but you're more sort of pulling up 10,000 feet and saying, okay, okay, I'm in a holistic sort of role. I'm thinking about governance and workflows and taxonomies and human processes that bring it all together. Now, you, it's, it's one of those things where like, right now I do all of these things. And when I think about like, if I were to go back out in the world and look for a job, 
Um, it's almost like I'm not really sure I could do all of these things, but it depends on how the companies are defining these things as well. I've seen job descriptions that are very like disparate in terms of like, this is a, a sort of aggregation based on all of the things that I've seen. It's sort of an average. Um, but at the same time, I feel like there are some areas where people who are content strategists have gone just wholesale and changed their role titles to content design. And it, it, it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a mismatch. It's almost like they're following a trend instead of following the truth of the role. So there's a lot to sort of unpack here. Um, and I think that, you know, I've basically been in this sort of bubble where my, my organization is like, you're a content strategist, you do all these things, depends on the project, good luck. And I get moved from project to project a lot. So my, I'm basically lowercase a agile all the time because I never know what I'm walking into. <laughs> um, so then, okay, that, that, that's content strategy. Actually, before I move on, are there any questions about content strategy? Like, Two minute questions. Nothing in Slack. Super. So let's look at this, this massive thing called Industry 4.0. Um, what's really interesting, I did a lot of reading and watching and trying to understand. And it feels like Industry 4.0 was very much a thing like a year or two ago. And from what I saw, it's, it's almost like the, the death of sort of literature and the articles and stuff from my searches seem to drop off at the end of last year, surprise. <laughs> um, but it, it's almost like, like it was really hot a few years ago and then it just kind of simmered for a while. Um, and when we look at the pillars of Industry 4.0, it's a lot, there's a lot happening here. Um, and all of these things, it's this, you know, idea that we're, you know, going into a place where we can make technology smarter. Um, Mark Lawrence does a TED talk about Industry 4.0, where he talks about machines becoming more human and how the sensors act as eyes and actuation is acting as hands and process control is, you know, creating brains and machines. And, you know, we're basically giving machines all of the tools they need to sort of take in enough information and compare it to what he calls a digital twin that the machine keeps in its brain. And then if we feed information and enough algorithms and, and, you know, we can get away from the, you do one job, <laughs> like the Rick and Morty, like you, you have one, one job, you have one purpose, you pass butter <laughs> and you do it really well. You get into a place where it's more like, okay, so you have some set, you know, rules for solving very specific problems. And then the rest of it, let's see if you can solve it. Let's see if we can help you solve that. Right. And so, you know, you get into this sort of, there's this old fashioned phrase that I heard for this, you know, the rise of cyber physical systems where we're basically sort of melding the two together um, and letting machines sort of rationalize on their own based on what we teach them. Now, the thing about this is there, there's a lot to unpack here in general, because, you know, on a good day, it's really hard to automate a human process, like just a straightforward human process, because what humans say they do and what they do from user behavior research and 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 data and all this other stuff is they're two different things entirely so you know trying to and then you know have that sort of scamper out to the different domains and how they interface with each other and processes and stuff is a lot there's a lot to normalize there and there's a lot of potential for garbage in garbage out all of this requires like just for the human stuff requires a lot of intense collaboration lots of openness tons of over communication lots of normalizing shared language and shared vocabulary um the two previous talks i think touched on that a little bit as well this idea that nobody has the same definition for anything how are we going to teach a machine how to do any of this it's bananas right so <laughs> at the end of the day what we're really doing with industry 4.0 is that we're teach we're creating content for and with humans and john maeda is um he's the uh, customer experience um he's the vice president of customer experience i hope i'm getting his title right um at publicist sapient now 
And he wrote this article recently uh, for VentureBeat about automating apathy and the potential to automate activism. And this was a quote that was in that article that's just so spot on because it really is like if we don't have our acts together, we can feed machines really unhealthy data and information and content, the stuff that's supposed to be like the meat and potatoes of communication, and they can spread all of that rotten stuff very, very quickly. But at the same time, if we do it well, we can have them spread good information very quickly. And so, you know, even if we're not really thinking about like, even if we set sort of the industry 4.0 stuff aside, the only way businesses function is to, you know, increase efficiency and reduce costs and enable employees through clear communication. And, you know, we need to understand ourselves and the processes in a very holistic way just to, just to make this happen on a very base level. And it's a very important thing to remember because the human touch is going to be incredibly important here. The University of Derby put out, and I probably pronounced that wrong, it's probably Darby. <laughs> My American is showing, I'm still learning English, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the thing about it is that the human touch is going to be incredibly important. You know, the one thing that even if we can get the machines to do everything that we want it to do, if you want Cylons, like, <laughs> you're going to have to give them the whole kit and caboodle. You have to give them the whole human package um and if we do create silence you know the one thing i mean there's a lot of arguments about whether silence can feel i feel like i've tried into dangerous territory here but you know it's really going to be about ensuring communication that the content is spot on that we're problem solving together this is a very complex thing to do and supporting change management and I mean, content strategists, good content strategists specialize in this human touch. We specialize in being able to understand everything. We don't need, so I will say that subject matter expertise is helpful. It's a nice to have in my experience. I've worked in multiple like verticals. They basically throw me at stuff. And so I may not know anything about that vertical, but I know how to talk to people. I know how to get answers. I know how to audit all of their content for different types and understand how they're being used and then figure out ways to more effectively get those things to the right people at the right time and then store them in ways that, you know, maintenance isn't like pulling teeth. You know, it, it and it's not easy. Like it's, it's a change management nightmare, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, but I'm a puzzler. I like solving problems. I like talking to people and I like reducing suffering. So, you know, when a content strategist has those elements to their skill set, you know, without the deep knowledge of the subject area, we can still look at everything and say, okay, help me help you spread good information quickly. That's basically all I'm trying to do here. And that crosses everything. That crosses how your systems are built. It crosses how your humans behave. It crosses where your documentation is stored, what that means, shared vocabularies, everything. So if we were to like, <laughs> I'm a huge nerd. If we were to take <laughs> all of our multiverses and normalize them and average them out, we would probably, in my mind, end up with average two paths players um, because bringing together good data and the human touch is the difference between tone deaf actions and real agile action and right now what we have out in the world is stuff like this adorable brand video i don't know if anyone's seen this yet it's one of several um parodies on youtube right now of this idea of this is a really hard time for everyone. And we're here for you. And the way that we can be here for you is to sell you our product. It's really, but we're super here for you. We're here to support you. It's very important to us that you are safe and well, and you can, you can have all of these things by buying our products. It's this kind of, this is like the ultimate in like 
messy hubris thinking <laughs> where someone thinks they have a really good idea. They think they understand the audience. They think they can read the room and they take data and they don't necessarily analyze it in the most human way. They analyze it in a very sort of, how can we make money from this way? And they spread bad human things fast this way. Now, if we were to sort of take a more, a, a more empathetic and, you know, content forward and human approach, you can take massive data. Like, for example, you can take massive data and AI analysis and, you know, add some empathy and human behavior understanding and human computer interaction, you know, sort of understanding and really start to spread good information quickly. And by spreading good information quickly, you make all of these things, these pillars in Industry 4.0 possible. So I'm thinking about, you know, automated person, persona generation. These are just ideas that kind of pop my head as I'm researching, right? So the idea that not only do we funnel the human into the machines, we can kind of take something from the machines and measure the human because people, you know, what they say and what they do oftentimes are different, you know, decision making things happen, being able to track for what a whole population of people is doing and then normalize that data and try to understand you know compare that data against conversations with people use both approaches we can start to collate materials where we can not only help human beings have you know happier work environments and suffer less but also have healthy things to feed machines so that they can spread good information quickly and then we get silence but not really because then they won't be angry with us in any case <laughs> Speculative design is another area that, you know, isn't limited to user experience. It's not limited to web. Being able to sort of think five, ten years out and really think about what we want, what we don't want, what the challenges and opportunities could be, really live in that agile, like, fail fast kind of space to think about innovating forward and then using content to communicate that, using content to record that using content to share those ideas and normalize our shared vocabulary so we're all on the same page about what we're excited to be doing in the future and then you know content strategy we're not change agents well we're, we're not change management specialists but we are like people who work with change agents and so between sort of being able to look at all the content and bring all of the content and the process together and figure out how it trickles out into everything from, you know, a, a documentation knowledge base to a touch screen for a machine to a conversation that you have in a training session to sales collateral, like making sure that all of those communication touch points are speaking the same language and that everyone's suffering is being reduced while we feed machines good things to spread good information quickly. So what, you know, what it kind of means in my mind, I started whiteboarding this because of course I have a whiteboard at home because I'm that nerd, but you know, I'm, I'm sort of drawing things around and trying to figure things out. And I've got my mind map, which I'll show you later. Track, I've seen it, it's like crazy. But you know, normally you have this sort of typical linear approach where you start with an idea and then someone goes out and gets the money for the technology to build it because that's easy in comparison to everything else that you want to do because people are hard. And then they try to, you know, say, okay, now we've built this thing, people use it, and this is how you do it. And it's like, hmm, that doesn't always work. And it's kind of fussy and it's really hard. And then, you know, at the end, if we're lucky, <laughs> we get documentation. <laughs> we get space for documentation, time for documentation, budget for documentation. We're not spending, you know, all night trying to write something up. And then sometimes they just give up and say, you know what? Everyone just has to live with an unpleasant system and everything gets really messy for a really long time. Um, what I'm thinking of is of a very, and this is not meant to be like content strategy runs everything. We don't want to run anything. We, we spend enough time in projects trying to like figure out what everyone's life is because they don't know themselves. We're not really interested in being in charge. But, you know, we have a, if we can think about this as a communication forward approach, if everything stems out of communication and if content is a conveyance of communication, then, you know, you start from what are the messages? This is kind of like starting from like a tone of voice guidelines sort of place. But even before that, 
to feed the ideation and have ideation be collaborative and have research and have that be sort of a continuous iterative cycle on one side. And then on the other side, you have, you know, change management and ongoing analysis paired with like agile iterative building and improvements. And, you know, that's sort of a continuous cycle. And what I wish I had been able to like build this diagram the way I really wanted to. This was like the simplest way I could think to do it. But those things feed each other. And the honest truth is that there would be arrows all over the place because, you know, there are going to be times where ideation has to go to add to like build and say, hey, is this, what do we need to think about to make this possible? And then come back to this process and sort of iterate here. But being able to be sort of communicative and content forward and um, agile and collaborative in this way means that, you know, if you wanted to build Cylons, it might get easier. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that means that, you know, big data has more purpose because understand what you're actually analyzing it for and what you're trying to do with it. An augmented reality sort of experience where you're able to say, lay an augmented experience screen over a machine and figure out exactly where you have to go, kind of like those little screens on the photocopiers that tell you where the paper jams are, but it's a transparency overlay over a thing. And it tells you where you need to like stick your finger without your finger getting cut off to like <laughs> fix a thing. Like all of these things become infinitely more possible because we're all on the same page. The content has communicated what we need and it continues to do that as opposed to being this sort of afterthought sort of thing that happens at the end. So with all of that, you know, here I am thinking all of these, you know, pie in the sky, beautiful things. It's like, oh my God, if we could just get people to talk to each other, that would be amazing. And if we could just find the ways that people could communicate effectively with each other while managing any kind of needs that they have for communication, um, and, you know, health needs and all that other stuff that is really important, like meeting people where they are to communicate with them the best ways possible. You know, if we could build Cylons, if the machines are minding the till at this point, right, then you take all of the logistics of, oh, we can't do that, that's too complicated or whatever, and you have the machines do it, then all of a sudden you have more time to think instead of doing all the time, and it gives us the opportunity to do better we can start to think in that true speculative design methodology of, you know what, it's not just what do we do for the user or the customer or the process participant or what have you. It goes out into, you know, what can we do for society? What can we do for ecosystems? What can we do for the environment? What can we do for our community? How do we take our businesses and make them something that creates the purpose for good? And that's a really important thing right now. It, it has been an important thing in the past and it's been used as a marketing thing, but now it feels like it's starting to really land that it's important in other ways that are bigger than just come by this thing because we're cool. Um, there was something else that um, John Maeda said in his article um, about automatic activism, um, where the community of people who speak machine is a small one, but we have a lot of sway. And because we're digitally privileged, we have the potential to automate more harm than good or to automate more good than harm. So that applies to everything from the contained process to all of the things that we can be doing outside of our contained processes to create better good out in the world. And, you know, I think about things like, you know, Br Brene Brown, bless her, I love her to pieces. You know, she says maybe stories are just data with a soul. There's the innovation. Innovation and, uh, innovation and public person, the Institute, oh, words, I promise I'm a Trump, I'm like a trained professional. The Institute for Innovation and Public per Purpose at the University College of London is trying to turn capitalism on its head by creating content and methodologies and ways of working that help government organizations get back the money that they've been pouring into commercial enterprises forever and losing like people are starting to get into this like serving positive purpose place and you know this is you know a really good time for that so in my mind i'm going to close with this idea that you know doing good really is important right now 
And when I think of content strategy, the tenets of content strategy are basically the you know, substance, tone, voice, architecture, and humanity of all of your messages, no matter how they are conveyed in whatever content, matter every single time. And being able to listen to everyone in process is key to communication. And anything that we can do to strategize and wrangle and Marie Kondo, whatever we can do with this process to reduce suffering and increase the ability to do that is something that I can totally get behind. So yeah, that's, that's all I got. Um, if there are any questions, I'm here for you. Yes. We have two <laughs> questions. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'll be reading the Slack questions. There are two, but okay. uh, try to be short because yes. we're at the end of our time. We might extend a little bit uh, after that. Uh, so first question, how would you persuade a decision maker to allow time to think before doing? Oh my God, that's the struggle, right? <laughs> um, I think that the best way oftentimes to convince anyone to do anything is basically to go with what, go with what convinces them. So a lot of times with decision makers, it's about numbers, it's about KPIs, it's about goals, it's about what you can measure. Um, this is a little bit like human behavior. It's a little bit like um, benef beneficent interrogation tactics where you kind of figure out what really makes them tick and find that thing and find a way to dovetail what you're trying to convince them to do with what would, you know, what they believe in. And that usually will shift the tide. Cool. Uh, next question. Do you always write or otherwise create content for humans? Or do you also consider that the information may be read and processed by a machine? Um, I consider both. I have worked in spaces where, uh, and on projects where it could go either way. Um, there was a prototype that I worked on that actually was a digital assistant. Um, and it, it was meant to answer questions and there was a, an intended goal of having someone actually be in touch with a human being. And so being able to architect that content so that a machine could sort of pick and choose based on sort of a choose your own adventure uh, style um, decision tree, but also knowing that people were going to be on the other end of it consuming it uh, was something that I had to do on that project and a bunch of others. So you basically have to think with about 10 hats on uh, when you're content strategizing, depending on what you're building. And I have an unrelated question. Have you ever worked at Ikea? That's just because of your background. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I do love Ikea. It's kind of a problem. <laughs> um, uh, no, the, I'm, I'm a really big fan of downloading um, different backgrounds for Zoom. It's become kind of an obsession recently. I have like all of the Studio Ghibli um, backgrounds that they published. Um, I went through and got a bunch of the Ikea backgrounds. I've got, I've got little collections all over my, all over my machine. So I felt like an office environment was the <laughs> environment for this talk. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrea.